The land down under has never been easier to reach. United Airlines has more flights between the U.S. and Australia than any other U.S. airline, so you can fly nonstop to destinations like Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. Explore dazzling cities, savor the very best of Aussie cuisine, and get up close and personal with the wildlife. Who doesn't want to hold a koala? Go to united.com slash Australia to book your adventure. It's time for Tuesday Terror here on the Mutual Audio Network. Be sure to leave the lights on while you listen. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Section 1 of The Windigo by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Windigo by Algernon Blackwood. Part 1. A considerable number of hunting parties were out that year, without finding so much as a fresh trail. For the moose were uncommonly shy, and the various nimrods returned to the bosoms of their respective families with the best excuses the facts of their imaginations could suggest. Dr. Cathcart, among others, came back without a trophy. But he brought instead the memory of an experience which he declares was worth all the bull moose that had ever been shot. But then Cathcart, of Aberdeen, was interested in other things besides moose, amongst them the vagaries of the human mind. This particular story, however, found no mention in his book on collective hallucination, for the simple reason, so he confided once to a fellow colleague, that he himself played too intimate a part in it to form a competent judgment of the affair as a whole. Besides himself and his guide, Hank Davis, there was young Simpson, his nephew, a divinity student destined for the wee Kirk, then on his first visit to Canadian backwoods, and the latter's guide, Defago. Joseph Defago was a French Canuck, who had strayed from his native province of Quebec years before, and had got caught in rat portage when the Canadian Pacific Railway was a building. A man who, in addition to his unparalleled knowledge of woodcraft and bush lore, could also sing the old voyageur songs and tell a capital hunting yarn into the bargain. He was deeply susceptible, moreover, to that singular spell which the wilderness lays upon certain lonely natures, and he loved the wild solitudes with a kind of romantic passion that amounted almost to an obsession. The life of the backwoods fascinated him, whence doubtless his surpassing efficiency in dealing with their mysteries. On this particular expedition he was Hank's choice. Hank knew him and swore by him. He also swore at him, just as a pal might, and since he had a vocabulary of picturesque, if not utterly meaningless, oaths, the conversation between the two stalwart and hardy woodsmen was often of a rather lively description. This river of expletives, however, Hank agreed to damn a little, out of respect for his old hunting boss, Dr. Cathcart, whom of course he addressed after the fashion of the country, as Doc, and also because he understood that young Simpson was already a bit of a parson. He had, however, one objection to Defago, and one only, which was that the French-Canadian sometimes exhibited what Hank described as the output of a cursed and dismal mind, meaning apparently that he sometimes was true to type, Latin type, and suffered fits of a kind of silent moroseness when nothing could induce him to utter speech. Defago, that is to say, was imaginative and melancholy. And as a rule, it was too long a spell of civilization that induced the attacks, for a few days of the wilderness invariably cured them. This, then, was the party of four that found themselves in camp the last week in October of that shy moose year, way up in the wilderness north of Rat Portage, a forsaken and desolate country. There was also Punk, an Indian, who had accompanied Dr. Cathcart and Hank on their hunting trips in previous years, and who acted as a cook. His duty was merely to stay in camp, catch fish, and prepare venison steaks and coffee at a few minutes' notice. 
He dressed in the worn-out clothes bequeathed to him by former patrons, and except for his coarse black hair and dark skin, he looked in these city garments no more like a real redskin than a stage negro looks like a real African. For all that, however, Punk had in him still the instincts of his dying race. His taciturn silence and his endurance survived, also his superstition. The party round the blazing fire that night were despondent, for a week had passed without a single sign of recent moose discovering itself. Defago had sung his song and plunged into a story, but Hank, in bad humor, reminded him so often that he kept mussing up the facts so that it was most all nothing but a petered-out lie, that the Frenchman had finally subsided into a sulky silence which nothing seemed likely to break. Dr. Cathcart and his nephew were fairly done after an exhausting day. Punk was washing up the dishes, grunting to himself under the lean-to of branches, where he later also slept. No one troubled to stir the slowly dying fire. Overhead the stars were brilliant in a sky quite wintry, and there was so little wind that ice was already forming stealthily along the shores of the still lake behind them. The silence of the vast, listening forest stole forward and enveloped them. Hank broke in suddenly with his nasal voice. "'I'm in favor of breaking new ground tomorrow, Doc,' he observed with energy, looking across at his employer. "'We don't stand a dead dago's chance around here.' "'Agreed,' said Cathcart, always a man of few words. "'Think the idea is good.' "'Sure, Pop, it's good,' Hank resumed with confidence. "'Suppose now you and I strike west, up Garden Lakeway for a change.' None of us ain't touched that quiet bit of land yet. I'm with you. And you, Defago, take Simpson along in the small canoe, skip across the lake, portage over into Fifty Island water, and take a good squint down that thar southern shore. The moose yarded there like hell last year, and for all we know they may be doing it again this year just to spite us. Defago, keeping his eyes on the fire, said nothing by way of reply. He was still offended, possibly, about his interrupted story. "'No one's been up that way this year, and I'll lay my bottom dollar on that,' Hank added with emphasis, as though he had a reason for knowing. He looked over at his partner sharply. "'Better take the little silk tent and stay away a couple of nights,' he concluded, as though the matter were definitely settled. For Hank was recognized as general organizer of the hunt, and in charge of the party. It was obvious to anyone that Defago did not jump at the plan, but his silence seemed to convey something more than ordinary disapproval and across his sensitive dark face there passed a curious expression, like a flash of firelight, not so quickly, however, that the three men had not time to catch it. "'He funked for some reason, I thought,' Simpson said afterwards in the tent he shared with his uncle. Dr. Cathcart made no immediate reply, although the look had interested him enough at the time for him to make a mental note of it. The expression had caused him a passing uneasiness he could not quite account for at the moment. But Hank, of course, had been the first to notice it, and the odd thing was that instead of becoming explosive or angry over the other's reluctance, he at once began to humor him a bit. "'But there ain't no special reason why no one's been up there this year,' he said with a perceptible hush in his tone. "'Not the reason you mean, anyway. Last year it was the fires that kept folks out, and this year I guess—I guess it just happened so, that's all.' His manner was clearly meant to be encouraging." Joseph Defago raised his eyes a moment, then dropped them again. A breath of wind stole out over the forest and stirred the embers into a passing blaze. Dr. Cathcart again noticed the expression in the guide's face, and again he did not like it. But this time the nature of the look betrayed itself. In those eyes, for an instant, he caught the gleam of a man scared in his very soul. It disquieted him more than he cared to admit. "'Bad Indians up that way?' he asked with a laugh to ease matters a little, while Simpson, too sleepy to notice this subtle by-play, moved off to bed with a prodigious yawn. Or, or anything wrong with the country, he added when his nephew was out of hearing. Hank met his eye with something less than his usual frankness. He's just scared, he replied good-humoredly. Scared stiff about some old fairy tale. That's all, ain't it, old pard? And he gave Defago a friendly kick on the moccasined foot that lay nearest the fire. Defago looked up quickly, 
as from an interrupted reverie, a reverie, however, that had not prevented his seeing all that went on about him. "'Scared nothing,' he answered with a flush of defiance. "'There's nothing in the bush that can scare Joseph DeFago, and don't you forget it.' And the natural energy with which he spoke made it impossible to know whether he told the whole truth or only part of it. Hank turned towards the doctor. He was just going to add something when he stopped abruptly and looked around. A sound close behind them in the darkness made all three start. It was old Punk, who had moved up from his lean-to while they talked, and now stood there just beyond the circle of firelight, listening. "'Another time, Doc,' Hank whispered with a wink. "'When the gallery ain't stepped down into the stalls.' and springing to his feet, he slapped the Indian on the back, and cried noisily, "'Come up to the fire and warm your dirty red skin a bit.' He dragged him towards the blaze and threw more wood on. "'That was a mighty good feed you give us an hour or two back,' he continued heartily, as though to set the man's thoughts on another scent. "'And it ain't Christian to let you stand out there freezing your old soul to hell while we're getting all good and toasted.' Punk moved in and warmed his feet, smiling darkly at the other's volubility, which he only half understood but saying nothing. And presently Dr. Cathcart, seeing that further conversation was impossible, followed his nephew's example and moved off to the tent, leaving the three men smoking over the now blazing fire. It's not easy to undress in a small tent without waking one's companion. And Cathcart, hardened and warm-blooded as he was, in spite of his fifty-odd years, did what Hank would have described as considerable of his twilight in the open. He noticed during the process that Punk had meanwhile gone back to his lean-to, and that Hank and Defago were at it hammer and tongs, or rather hammer and anvil, the little French-Canadian being the anvil. It was all very like the conventional stage picture of Western melodrama, the fire lighting up their faces with patches of alternate red and black, Defago in slouch hat and moccasins in the part of the Badlands villain, Hank open-faced and hatless, with that reckless fling of his soldiers, the honest and deceived hero. And old Punk, eavesdropping in the background, supplying the atmosphere of mystery. The doctor smiled as he noticed the details. But at the same time, something deep within him, he hardly knew what, shrank a little, as though an almost imperceptible breath of warning had touched the surface of his soul and was gone again before he could seize it. Probably it was traceable to that scared expression he had seen in the eyes of Defago. Probably, for this hint of fugitive emotion otherwise escaped his usually so keen analysis. Defago, he was vaguely aware, might cause trouble somehow. He was not as steady a guide as Hank, for instance. Further than that he could not get. He watched the men a moment longer before diving into the stuffy tent, where Simpson already slept soundly. Hank, he saw, was swearing like a mad African in a New York nigger saloon. But it was the swearing of affection. The ridiculous oaths flew freely now that the cause of their obstruction was asleep. Presently he put his arm almost tenderly upon his comrade's shoulder, and they moved off together into the shadows where their tent stood faintly glimmering. Punk, too, a moment later followed their example and disappeared between his odorous blankets in the opposite direction. Dr. Cathcart then likewise turned in, weariness and sleep still fighting in his mind, with an obscure curiosity to know what it was that had scared Defago about the country up Fifty Island Waterway, wondering, too, why Punk's presence had prevented the completion of what Hank had to say. Then sleep overtook him. He would know tomorrow. Hank would tell him the story while they trudged after the elusive moose. Deep silence fell about the little camp planted there so audaciously in the jaws of the wilderness. The lake gleamed like a sheet of black glass beneath the stars. The cold air pricked. In the draughts of night that poured their silent tide from the depths of the forest, with messages from distant ridges and from lakes just beginning to freeze, there lay already the faint, bleak odors of coming winter. White men, with their dull scent, might never have divined them, the fragrance of the wood fire would have concealed from them these almost electrical hints of moss and bark and hardening swamp a hundred miles away. Even Hank and Defago, subtly in league with the soul of the woods as they were, would probably have spread their delicate nostrils in vain. But an hour later, 
when all slept like the dead, old Punk crept from his blankets and went down to the shore of the lake like a shadow, silently, as only Indian blood can move. He raised his head and looked about him. The thick darkness rendered sight of small avail, but like the animals, he possessed other senses that darkness could not mute. He listened, then sniffed the air. Motionless as a hemlock stem, he stood there. After five minutes again he lifted his head and sniffed, and yet once again. A tingling of the wonderful nerves that betrayed itself by no outer sign ran through him as he tested the keen air. Then merging his figure into the surrounding blackness, in a way that only wild men and animals understand, he turned, still moving like a shadow, and went stealthily back to his lean-to and his bed. And soon after he slept, the change of wind he had divined stirred gently the reflection of the stars within the lake. Rising among the far ridges of the country, beyond Fifty Island Water, it came from the direction in which he had stared, and it passed over the sleeping camp, with a faint and sighing murmur, through the tops of the big trees, that was almost too delicate to be audible. With it down the desert paths of night, though too faint, too high even for the Indian's hair-like nerves, there passed a curious thin odor, strangely disquieting, an odor of something that seemed unfamiliar, utterly unknown. The French-Canadian and the man of Indian blood each stirred uneasily in his sleep just about this time, though neither of them woke. Then the ghost of that unforgettably strange odor passed away and was lost among the leagues of tenantless forest beyond. Part 2 In the morning the camp was astir before the sun. There had been a light fall of snow during the night, and the air was sharp. Punk had done his duty betimes, for the odors of coffee and fried bacon reached every tent. All were in good spirits. "'Wind's shifted,' cried Hank vigorously, watching Simpson and his guide already loading the small canoe. "'It's across the lake. Dead right for you fellows. And the snow will make bully trails. If there's any moose mussin' around up thar, they'll not get so much as a tail-end scent of you, with the wind as it is. "'Good luck, Monsieur Defago,' he added facetiously, giving the name its French pronunciation for once. "'Bon chance!' Defago returned the good wishes, apparently in the best of spirits, the silent mood gone. Before eight o'clock, old Punk had the camp to himself. Cathcart and Hank were far along the trail that led westwards, while the canoe that carried Defago and Simpson, with silk tent and grub for two days, was already a dark speck bobbing on the bosom of the lake, going due east. The wintry sharpness of the air was tempered now by a sun that topped the wooded ridges and blazed with a luxurious warmth upon the world of lake and forest below. Loons flew skimming through the sparkling spray that the wind lifted. Divers shook their dripping heads to the sun and popped smartly out of sight again, and as far as eye could reach rose the leagues of endless, crowding bush, desolate in its lonely sweep and grandeur, untrodden by foot of man, and stretching its mighty and unbroken carpet right up to the frozen shores of Hudson Bay. Simpson, who saw it all for the first time, as he paddled hard in the bows of the dancing canoe, was enchanted by its austere beauty. His heart drank in the sense of freedom in great spaces, just as his lungs drank in the cool and perfumed wind. Behind him in the stern seat, singing fragments of his native shanties, Defago steered the craft of birch bark like a thing of life, answering cheerfully all his companions' questions. Both were gay and light-hearted. On such occasions men lose the superficial, worldly distinctions. They become human beings working together for a common end. Simpson the employer, and Defago the employed, among these primitive forces, were simply two men, the guider and the guided. Superior knowledge, of course, assumed control, and the younger man fell without a second thought into the quasi-subordinate position. He never dreamed of objecting, when Defago dropped the mister, and addressed him as, Say Simpson, or Simpson boss which was invariably the case before they reached the farther shore after a stiff paddle of twelve miles against a headwind. He only laughed and liked it, then ceased to notice it at all. 
for this divinity student was a young man of parts and character, though as yet, of course, untraveled, and on this trip, the first time he had seen any country but his own and little Switzerland, the huge scale of things somewhat bewildered him. It was one thing, he realized, to hear about primeval forests, but quite another to see them, while to dwell in them and seek acquaintance with their wild life was, again, an initiation that no intelligent man could undergo without a certain shifting of personal values hitherto held for permanent and sacred. Simpson knew the first faint indication of this emotion when he held the new three o three rifle in his hands and looked along its pair of faultless gleaming barrels. The three days' journey to their headquarters, by lake and portage, had carried the process a stage farther, and now that he was about to plunge beyond even the fringe of wilderness, where they were camped into the virgin heart of uninhabited regions as vast as Europe itself, the true nature of the situation stole upon him with an effect of delight and awe that his imagination was fully capable of appreciating. It was himself and Defago against a multitude at least, against a titan. The bleak splendors of these remote and lonely forests rather overwhelmed him with the sense of his own littleness. That stern quality of the tangled backwoods, which can only be described as merciless and terrible, rose out of these far blue woods, swimming upon the horizon, and revealed itself. He understood the silent warning. He realized his own utter helplessness. Only Defago, as a symbol of a distant civilization where man was master, and a pitiless death by exhaustion and starvation. It was thrilling to him, therefore, to watch Defago turn over the canoe upon the shore, pack the paddles carefully underneath, and then proceed to blaze the spruce stems for some distance on either side of an almost invisible trail, with the careless remark thrown in, "'Say, Simpson, if anything happens to me, you'll find the canoe all correct by these marks. Then strike due west into the sun to hit the home camp again, see?' It was the most natural thing in the world to say, and he said it without any noticeable inflection of the voice, only it happened to express the youth's emotion at the time, with an utterance that was symbolic of the situation, and of his own helplessness as a factor in it. He was alone with Defago in a primitive world. That was all. The canoe, another symbol of man's ascendancy, was now to be left behind. Those small yellow patches, made on the trees by the axe, were the only indications of its hiding place. Meanwhile, shouldering the packs between them, each man carried his own rifle. They followed the slender trail over rocks and fallen trunks and across half-frozen swamps, skirting numerous lakes that fairly gemmed the forest, their borders fringed with mist, and towards five o'clock found themselves suddenly on the edge of the woods, looking out across a large sheet of water in front of them, dotted with pine-clad islands, of all describable shapes and sizes. Fifty Island Water, announced Defago wearily, and the sun just going to dip his bald old head into it, he added with unconscious poetry, and immediately they set about pitching camp for the night. In a very few minutes, under those skillful hands that never made a movement too much or a movement too little, the silk tent stood taut and cozy, the beds of balsam boughs ready laid, and a brisk cooking fire burned with the minimum of smoke, while the young Scotchman cleaned the fish they had caught trolling behind the canoe. Defago guessed he would just as soon take a turn through the bush for indications of moose. May come across a trunk where they been and rubbed horns, he said as he moved off, or feeding on the last of the maple leaves, and he was gone. His small figure melted away like a shadow in the dusk, while Simpson noted with a kind of admiration. How easily the forest absorbed him into herself. A few steps, it seemed, and he was no longer visible. Yet there was little underbrush hereabouts. The trees stood somewhat apart, well spaced, and in the clearings grew silver birch and maple, spear-like and slender, against the immense stems of spruce and hemlock. But for occasional prostrate monsters, and the boulders of grey rock that thrust uncouth shoulders here and there out of the ground, it might well have been a bit of park in the old country. Almost one might have seen it in the hand of man. A little to the right, however, began the great burnt section, miles in extent, proclaiming its real character. Brule, as it was called, 
where the fires of the previous year had raged for weeks, and the blackened stumps now rose gaunt and ugly, bereft of branches, like gigantic match-heads, stuck into the ground, savage and desolate beyond words. The perfume of charcoal and rain-soaked ashes still hung faintly about it. The dusk rapidly deepened. The glades grew dark. The crackling of the fire and the wash of little waves along the rocky lake shore were the only sounds audible. The wind had dropped with the sun, and in all that vast world of branches nothing stirred. Any moment, it seemed, the woodland gods, who are to be worshipped in silence and loneliness, might stretch their mighty and terrific outlines among the trees. In front, through the doorways pillared by huge straight stems, lay the stretch of fifty island water, a crescent-shaped lake some fifteen miles from tip to tip, and perhaps five miles across, where they were camped. A sky of rose and saffron, more clear than any atmosphere Simpson had ever known, still dropped its pale streaming fires across the waves, where the islands, a hundred surely, rather than fifty, floated like fairy barks of some enchanted fleet, fringed with pines whose crests fingered most delicately the sky. They almost seemed to move upwards as the light faded, about to weigh anchor and navigate the pathways of the heavens instead of the currents of their native and desolate lake. And strips of colored cloud, like flaunting pennons, signaled their departure to the stars. The beauty of the scene was strangely uplifting. Simpson smoked the fish and burnt his fingers into the bargain in his efforts to enjoy it, and at the same time tend the frying pan and the fire. Yet ever at the back of his thoughts lay that other aspect of the wilderness, the indifference to human life, the merciless spirit of desolation which took no note of man, the sense of his utter loneliness, now that even Defago had gone, came close as he looked about him and listened for the sound of his companion's returning footsteps. There was pleasure in the sensation, yet with it a perfectly comprehensible alarm, and instinctively the thought stirred in him, what should I, could I do, if anything happened and he did not come back? They enjoyed their well-earned supper, eating untold quantities of fish, and drinking unmilked tea strong enough to kill men who had not covered thirty miles of hard going, eating little on the way. And when it was over, they smoked and told stories round the blazing fire, laughing, stretching weary limbs, and discussing plans for the morrow. Defago was in excellent spirits, though disappointed at having no signs of moose to report. But it was dark, and he had not gone far. The brule, too, was bad. His clothes and hands were smeared with charcoal. Simpson, watching him, realized with renewed vividness their position, alone together in the wilderness. "'Defago,' he said presently, "'these woods, you know, are a bit too big to feel quite at home in, "'to feel comfortable in, I mean, eh?' "'He merely gave expression to the mood of the moment. "'He was hardly prepared for the earnestness, "'the solemnity even, with which the guide took him up. "'You've hit it right, Simpson, boss,' he replied, "'fixing his searching brown eyes on his face. "'And that's the truth, sure. "'There's no end to him, no end at all.' then he added in a lowered tone as if to himself there's lots found out that and gone plumb to pieces but the man's gravity of manner was not quite to the other's liking it was a little too suggestive for this scenery and setting he was sorry he had broached the subject he remembered suddenly how his uncle had told him that men were sometimes stricken with a strange fever of the wilderness when the seduction of the uninhabited wastes caught them so fiercely that they went forth half fascinated, half deluded, to their death. And he had a shrewd idea that his companion held something in sympathy with that queer type. He led the conversation on to the other topics, on to Hank and the doctor, for instance, and the natural rivalry as to who should get the first sight of Moose. "'If they went due west,' observed Defago carelessly, "'there's sixty miles between us now, with old Punk at Halfway House eating himself full to Boston with fish and coffee.' They laughed together over the pitcher. But the casual mention of those sixty miles again made Simpson realize the prodigious scale of this land where they hunted. Sixty miles was a mere step. Two hundred little more than a step. Stories of lost hunters rose persistently before his memory. 
the passion and mystery of homeless and wandering men, seduced by the beauty of great forests, swept his soul in a way too vivid to be pleasant. He wondered vaguely whether it was the mood of his companion that invited the unwelcome suggestion with such persistence. "'Sing us a song, Defago, if you're not too tired,' he asked. "'One of those old voyageur songs you sang the other night.' He handed his tobacco pouch to the guide, and then filled his own pipe, while the Canadian, nothing loth, sent his light voice across the lake in one of those plaintive, almost melancholy shanties, with which lumbermen and trappers lessen the burden of their labor. There was an appealing and romantic flavor about it, something that recalled the atmosphere of the old pioneer days, when Indians and wilderness were leagued together, battles frequent, and the old country farther off than it is today. The sound traveled pleasantly over the water, but the forest at their backs seemed to swallow it down with a single gulp that permitted neither echo nor resonance. It was in the middle of the third verse that Simpson noticed something unusual, something that brought his thoughts back with a rush from faraway scenes. A curious change had come into the man's voice. Even before he knew what it was, uneasiness caught him, and looking up quickly he saw that Devago, though still singing, was peering about him into the bush, as though he heard or saw something. His voice grew fainter, dropped to a hush, then ceased altogether. The same instant, with a movement amazingly alert, he started to his feet and stood upright, sniffing the air. Like a dog scenting game, he drew the air into his nostrils in short, sharp breaths, turning quickly as he did so, in all directions, and finally pointing down the lake shore eastwards. It was a performance unpleasantly suggestive, and at the same time singularly dramatic. Simpson's heart flooded disagreeably as he watched it. "'Lord, man, how you made me jump!' he exclaimed, on his feet beside him the same instant, and peering over his shoulder into the sea of darkness. "'What's up? Are you frightened?' Even before the question was out of his mouth, he knew it was foolish, for any man with a pair of eyes in his head could see that the Canadian had turned white down to his very gills. Not even sunburn in the glare of the fire could hide that. The student felt himself trembling a little, weakish in the knees, "'What's up?' he repeated quickly. "'Do you smell moose? "'Or anything queer, anything wrong?' "'He lowered his voice instinctively. "'The forest pressed round them, with its encircling wall. "'The nearer tree-stems gleamed like bronze in the firelight. "'Beyond that, blackness, and so far as he could tell, a silence of death. "'Just behind them a passing puff of wind lifted a single leaf, looked at it, then laid it softly down again, without disturbing the rest of the covey. It seemed as if a million invisible causes had combined just to produce that single visible effect. Other life pulsed about them, and was gone. Defago turned abruptly. The livid hue of his face had turned to a dirty gray. "'I never said I heard or smelt nothing,' he said slowly and emphatically, in an oddly altered voice, that conveyed somehow a touch of defiance. I was only taking a look around, so to speak. It's always a mistake to be too previous with your questions. Then he added suddenly, with obvious effort, in his more natural voice, Have you got the matches, Boss Simpson? And proceeded to light the pipe he had half filled just before he began to sing. Without speaking another word, they sat down again by the fire. Defago changing his side so that he could face the direction the wind came from for even a tenderfoot could tell that. Defago changed his position in order to hear and smell all there was to be heard and smelt. And since he now faced the lake with his back to the trees, it was evidently nothing in the forest that had sent so strange and sudden a warning to his marvelously trained nerves. "'Guess now I don't feel like singing any,' he explained presently of his own accord. "'That song kind of brings back memories that's troublesome to me.' I never ought to have begun it. It sets me on imagining things, see? Clearly the man was still fighting with some profoundly moving emotion. He wished to excuse himself in the eyes of the other. But the explanation, in that it was only part of the truth, was a lie, and he knew perfectly well that Simpson was not deceived by it. For nothing could explain away the livid terror that had dropped over his face while he stood there sniffing the air. And nothing— 
no amount of blazing fire or chatting on ordinary subjects, could make that camp exactly as it had been before. The shadow of an unknown horror, naked if unguessed, that had flashed for an instant in the face and gestures of the guide, had also communicated itself, vaguely and therefore more potently, to his companion. The guide's visible efforts to dissemble the truth only made things worse. Moreover, to add to the younger man's uneasiness was the difficulty, nay, the impossibility he felt of asking questions, and also his complete ignorance as to the cause. Indians, wild animals, forest fires, all these he knew were wholly out of the question. His imagination searched vigorously, but in vain. Yet somehow or other, after another long spell of smoking, talking, and roasting themselves before the great fire, the shadow that had so suddenly invaded their peaceful camp began to skirt. Perhaps Defago's efforts, or the return of his quiet and normal attitude, accomplished this. Perhaps Simpson himself had exaggerated the fare out of all proportion to the truth. Or possibly the vigorous air of the wilderness brought its own powers of healing. Whatever the cause, the feeling of immediate horror seemed to have passed away as mysteriously as it had come, for nothing occurred to feed it. Simpson began to feel that he had permitted himself the unreasoning terror of a child. He put it down partly to a certain subconscious excitement that this wild and immense scenery generated in his blood, partly to the spell of solitude and partly to over-fatigue. That pallor in the guide's face was, of course, uncommonly hard to explain, yet it might have been due in some way to an effect of firelight or his own imagination. He gave it the benefit of the doubt. He was scotch. When a somewhat unordinary emotion has disappeared, the mind always finds a dozen ways of explaining away its causes. Simpson lit a last pipe and tried to laugh to himself. On getting home to Scotland it would make quite a good story. He did not realize that his laughter was a sign that terror still lurked in the recesses of his soul, that, in fact, it was merely one of the conventional signs by which a man, seriously alarmed, tries to persuade himself that he is not so. Defago, however, heard that low laughter and looked up with surprise on his face. The two men stood side by side, kicking the embers about before going to bed. It was ten o'clock, a late hour for hunters to be still awake. "'What's tickling yer?' he asked in his ordinary tone, yet gravely. "'I, I was thinking of our little toy woods at home just at that moment,' stammered Simpson, coming back to what really dominated his mind, and startled by the question and comparing them to, to all this, and he swept his arms round him to indicate the bush. A pause followed in which neither of them said anything. All the same, I wouldn't laugh about it, if I was you, Defago added, looking over Simpson's shoulder into the shadows. There's places in there nobody won't never see into. Nobody knows what lives in there either. Too big, too far off? The suggestion in the guide's manner was immense and horrible. Defago nodded. The expression on his face was dark. He too felt uneasy. The young man understood that in a hinterland of this size there might well be depths of woods that would never in the life of the world be known or trodden. The thought was not exactly the sort he welcomed. In a loud voice, cheerfully, he suggested that it was time for bed. But the guide lingered, tinkering with the fire, arranging the stones needlessly, doing a dozen things that did not really need doing. Evidently there was something he wanted to say, yet found it difficult to get at. "'Say you, Boss Simpson,' he began suddenly, as the last shower of sparks went up into the air. "'You don't smell nothing, do you? Nothing particular, I mean?' The commonplace question, Simpson realized— "'veiled a dreadfully serious thought in his mind. "'A shiver ran down his back. "'Nothing but burning wood,' he replied firmly, "'kicking again at the embers. "'The sound of his own foot made him start. "'And all the evening you ain't smelt nothing?' "'persisted the guide, peering at him through the gloom. "'Nothing extraordinary? 
indifferent to anything else you ever smelt before? No, no, man, nothing at all, he replied aggressively, half angrily. Defago's face cleared. That's good, he exclaimed with evident relief. That's good to hear. Have you? asked Simpson sharply, and the same instant regretted the question. The Canadian came closer in the darkness. He shook his head. I guess not, he said, though without overwhelming conviction. It must have been just that song of mine that did it. It's the song they sing in lumber camps and godforsaken places like that, when they're scared the windigos somewhere around, doing a bit of swift traveling. And what's the windigo, pray? Simpson asked quickly, irritated because again he could not prevent that sudden shiver of the nerves. He knew that he was close upon the man's terror and the cause of it. Yet a rushing, passionate curiosity overcame his better judgment and his fear. Defago turned swiftly and looked at him, as though he were suddenly about to shriek. His eyes shone, but his mouth was wide open. Yet all he said, or whispered rather, for the voice sank very low, was, "'It's nothing. Nothing but what those lousy fellers believe when they've been hitting the bottle too long. A sort of great animal that lives up yonder.' He jerked his head northwards quick as lightning in its tracks, and bigger than anything else in the bush, and ain't supposed to be very good to look at. That's all. A backward superstition, began Simpson, moving hastily toward the tent, in order to shake off the hand of the guide that clutched his arm. Come, come, hurry up for the God's sake, and get the lantern going. It's time we were in bed and asleep, if we're going to be up with the sun tomorrow. The guide was close on his heels. I'm coming, he answered out of the darkness. I'm coming and after a slight delay he appeared with the lantern and hung it from a nail in the front pole of the tent. The shadows of a hundred trees shifted their places quickly as he did so, and when he stumbled over the rope, diving swiftly inside, the whole tent trembled as though a gust of wind struck it. The two men lay down, without undressing, upon their beds of soft balsam boughs, cunningly arranged. Inside all was warm and cozy, but outside— the world of crowding trees pressed close about them, marshalling their million shadows, and smothering the little tent that stood there like a wee white shell facing the ocean of tremendous forest. Between the two lonely figures within, however, there pressed another shadow that was not a shadow from the night. It was the shadow cast by the strange fear, never wholly exercised, that had leaped suddenly upon Defago in the middle of his singing. And Simpson, as he lay there, watching the darkness through the open flap of the tent, ready to plunge into the fragrant abyss of sleep, knew first that unique and profound stillness of a primeval forest when no wind stirs, and when the night has weight and substance that enters into the soul to bind a veil about it. Then sleep took him. Part 3 Thus it seemed to him, at least, Yet it was true that the lap of the water, just beyond the tent door, still beat time with his lessening pulses, when he realized that he was lying with his eyes open, and that another sound had recently introduced itself, with cunning softness, between the splash and murmur of the little waves. And long before he understood what this sound was, it had stirred in him the centers of pity and alarm. He listened intently, though at first in vain, for the running blood beat all its drums too noisily in his ears. Did it come, he wondered, from the lake or from the woods? Then suddenly, with a rush and a flutter of the heart, he knew that it was close beside him in the tent, and when he turned over for a better hearing, it focused itself, unmistakably not two feet away. It was a sound of weeping. Defago, upon his bed of branches, was sobbing in the darkness as though his heart would break, the blankets evidently stuffed against his mouth to stifle it. And his first feeling, before he could think or reflect, was the rush of a poignant and searching tenderness. This intimate human sound, heard amid the desolation about them, woke pity. It was so incongruous, so pitifully incongruous, and so vain. Tears in this vast and cruel wilderness, of what avail? He thought of a little child crying in mid-Atlantic, then, of course, with fuller realization, and the memory of what had gone before, came the descent of the terror upon him, 
and his blood ran cold. Defago, he whispered quickly. "'What's the matter?' He tried to make his voice very gentle. "'Are you in pain? Unhappy?' There was no reply, but the sounds ceased abruptly. He stretched his hand out and touched him. The body did not stir. "'Are you awake?' for it occurred to him that the man was crying in his sleep. "'Are you cold?' He noticed that his feet, which were uncovered, projected beyond the mouth of the tent. He spread an extra fold of his own blankets over them. The guide had slipped down in his bed, and the branches seemed to have dragged with him. He was afraid to pull the body back again, for fear of waking him. One or two tentative questions he ventured softly, but though he waited for several minutes there came no reply nor any sign of movement. Presently he heard his regular and quiet breathing, and putting his hand again gently on his breast, felt the steady rise and fall beneath. "'Let me know if anything's wrong,' he whispered, "'or if I can do anything. Wake me at once if you feel queer.' He hardly knew what to say. He lay down again, thinking and wondering what it all meant. Defago, of course, had been crying in his sleep. Some dream or other had afflicted him. Yet never in his life would he forget that pitiful sound of sobbing, and the feeling that the whole awful wilderness of woods listened. His own mind busied itself for a long time with the recent events of which this took its mysterious place as one, and though his reason successfully argued away all unwelcome suggestions, a sensation of uneasiness remained, resisting ejection, very deep-seated, peculiar beyond ordinary. End of section one. You're listening to Tuesday Terrors on the Mutual Audio Network. Tomorrow is our weekly anthology for science fiction and fantasy with Wednesday Wonders. Subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed for every day of amazing audio, or find the Wednesday Wonders feed in your favorite podcast players. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.